Kennedy's idea was you never take anything personally. Mm -hmm. That's how you lose. Mm -hmm. Kennedy never took anything personally when they assaulted him or insulted him. Mm -hmm. And he never took anything personally when he angrily, mm -hmm. you know, in political terms, angrily opposed Eastland mm -hmm. when Eastland said, you know, the Judiciary Committee is where civil rights legislation goes to die. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you to our brave souls who are with us in person with uh, the difficult weather that we're having uh, outside in Boston tonight. Um, my name is David Leonard. I am the president of the Boston Public Library and moderator of tonight's uh, conversation. Um, I would like to welcome Neil, uh, who is an accomplished author and um, uh, you know, uh, I think Walt Disney is one of your other um, brilliant yes. biographies that, that you have uh, contributed to, to, our, to our world. Well, I can say it's brilliant, but I will um, say that I wrote it. That's and um, you know, an award-winning winning author. Uh, tonight's conversation is actually part two of our conversation that we began in December, I think, of 2020, yes. um, uh, where we talked about the first volume um, of the subject, uh, Edward Kennedy. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that to bring some of you up to speed. And then we're going to do our best to have a conversation about um, uh, about the second volume, uh, which may have some relevance for our understanding of today's political reality. So, Neil, welcome. It's Thank it's so nice much. to have you here uh, in three dimensions, here. at least for those of us who are here in in, in person. Um, and uh, I'm just going to ask you to uh, maybe uh, uh, pick up um, what the break point between the two volumes, mm. and um, and then we'll we'll proceed from there. Well, I'll give a spoiler alert because at the end of uh, Volume One, Volume One ends with, uh, and, and Volume One is called Edward Kennedy and the Liberal Hour, the main title, that's the subtitle, The Main Towers Catching the Wind. And of course, it incorporates his brother's presidency, Lyndon Johnson's presidency, uh, the Great Society, and uh, the, the raft of liberal leg legislation that was passed in the wake of John Kennedy's death in 64 and 65. The Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 65, Medicare. So you have this, this great gust mm. of wind mm. that was blowing through the country and creating what I call in volume one this moral crease. Mm. And I say it's a moral crease because uh, one who has, anyone who has any knowledge of American history knows that uh, you know, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not anything gigantic. When, when Americans embrace morality, it's generally a crease. <laughs> but they did embrace morality. And it's, and, it's a, and it's a period in American life that is, is truly significant and exciting and ennobling. Mm -hmm. But, but, volume one ends uh, with Edward Kennedy literally on the run, literally on the run, from those ethnic white Americans in this city who had supported him and supported his family because Edward Kennedy, not all that vociferously either, I might add, but Edward Kennedy had come out in, uh, in advocacy of uh, busing to integrate Boston schools. And uh, this was something that just riled uh, the, the white populace of Boston. And Edward Kennedy was foolish enough at one point when there was an anti-busing rally uh, on the plaza outside uh, the John F. Kennedy Federal Building to go in thinking that, you know, the Kennedy magic would, would somehow work here and that he would, you know, calm these savage souls. Uh, quite the opposite happened. They chased him off the plaza and, uh, and literally chased him for his life. And he scampered into the, into the building. Several, not that long afterwards, uh, he was speaking at, a, uh, at a, a, an engagement that had nothing whatsoever to do with busing, but Kennedy had become a target uh, from throughout that school year. And when, when he was at that uh, engagement in Quincy, a crowd began gathering outside. And this time, uh, you know, there was, there was uh, 
the, the, the souls were really savage. And they, they smeared dog excrement on the handles of his car. And when he came out, uh, they literally not only pelted him, but hit him, struck him. And a phalanx of his aides got around him to try and escort him away as this seething crowd as a seething crowd <clears throat> gathered around him. And he looked for escape because they wanted to tear him limb from limb. I mean, this is sort of like January 6th. I mean, they really wanted to do bodily harm to him. This wasn't, well, we'll just scare him. I mean, they really wanted to injure him. And uh, he escaped down a, the, the, into a tea station where that phalanx held the crowd at bay and he was fortunate enough to have a train come in and he jumped on the train and that's how he escaped. And that's the end of volume one. Uh, kind of a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's clearly a, a, a sense that um, the, the, both volumes are both about the man and the family, but also they are about the political times that we are, are living through. Yeah, David, you couldn't be you know, more accurate in, in, uh, in characterizing it that way. I didn't set out, as I said you know, in our first discussion, I didn't set out to write a biography of Ted Kennedy. Uh, I, don't, I don't start out my projects that way. That's not how my mind works. I begin with questions questions that I want to have answered, questions that I have not answered myself or I wouldn't spend the time it takes to, to write the books. And the question for this book is, what happened to American liberalism? It was the dominant ideology at the time that Ted Kennedy enters the Senate at the end of 1962. Uh, he won the 62 election, but the occupant of that seat, who had been John Kennedy's former uh, roommate at Harvard, uh, decided to... Uh, to leave so that Ted could get seniority. So Ted becomes the senator in 1962, his brother is president. You could say that uh, liberalism was at something near its high water mark. I suppose its high water mark would be the Johnson administration and, and all that legislation that I mentioned. Uh, but here he is riding that, 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 that wave, you know, catching that wind, and in the course of his career, you know, liberalism becomes an epithet, which it pretty much is today. Uh, and I wanted to figure out why. So I wanted to embark on, on the, that's this project for that reason. And I chose the, the device of using the preeminent liberal of, of the last 50 years, Edward Kennedy, to explore what happened to liberalism. So yes, you know, I, I see these books I mean, this is a massive book. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna say it is. this is just volume two. And it's yeah. a massive book, it's heavy. I was saying to David that I, I, re I realized, I spoke at another event uh, last week, and that morning I was kind of looking at the vital statistics, and I realized that this book weighed more than my prematurely born grandson at his birth. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, I mean, but it's not just Edward Kennedy. Mm -hmm. This book is, I, I think it tells the, the political story of our lifetime. And the political story of our lifetime is how did we go from a nation that passed those civil rights acts, mm -hmm. a nation in which, if you look at the polling data, as I say in volume one, the American people, including white Americans, were avidly in favor of those things, mm -hmm. even though they had nothing personally to gain from it. Imagine that and compare that to today. They had nothing to gain from that, nothing, except some sense of moral uplift, I, I suppose. How did we go from that to where we are now? Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I think that what I try to do in these books mm -hmm. is tell the story of how the tectonic plates in America shifted, and the protagonist is Edward Kennedy because he's at the center of a lot of this. In some ways, he's the cause of some of it, uh, but he's also the sole, almost the sole individual in American political life during his lifetime who keeps on, who, who keeps that flickering flame from extinguishing. Um, I, I have so many questions now as a result <laughs> of that. Uh, you know, the, the subtitle is, and, and it's Edward Kennedy and the Rise of Conservatism. Yes. And uh, I think many of us are struggling 
uh, today to try and unpack um, why it feels like American society is more divided than ever, particularly uh, when it comes to matters of politics. Mm -hmm. First of all, is that a fair hypothesis? Is it just, it feels raw because it, we're living it? Mm -hmm. Was it always raw or is this in fact more, more divided? No, political scientists you know, do studies on, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there are studies on the Congress and Republican voting versus Democratic voting over the years. And, and this is, you know, the most polarized period in American history, probably since the Civil War. Uh, and most, most dangerous period in, I believe, American history. But you don't have to take my word for it when uh, just before the midterms, uh, Ken Burns sent out a, a solicitation which I got in my uh, mailbox, email box, uh, raising money for uh, Senator Hassan in, uh, in New Hampshire. And it's a rather long appeal, but the appeal was this, and now here's someone who's well-versed in American history. You know, he says, this is the most dangerous time in American history. And I would agree with him. It's not just the polarization. Uh, you know, it's the nature of that polarization. You know, when Edward Kennedy enters the Senate in the, in the what was called the liberal hour, it was the liberal hour, not because Democrats were, you know, left-wing crazies. It was the liberal hour because Republicans and Democrats were able to work together. And because there was a consensus in America. I don't want to be too Pollyannish about this, but there was a consensus, a general consensus, it was, a, it was largely a difference between means and ends. Obviously, there were extremes in both parties, particularly in the Republican Party. Uh, and if you want to read that story, there's a great book on it, Before the Storm, by Rick Perlstein. But, uh, but those, those fringes of the Republican Party had not yet entered the mainstream. And they didn't enter the mainstream until Barry Goldwater in 1964. And you saw what happened to him. You know, he was you know, massacred in the 1964 election. So. You know, there, there wasn't real polarization. And in fact, I, I always cite this, and I, I mention it in volume one. One of the most moving speeches, one of the most moving speeches during the 1964 Civil Rights Act debate, it's the penultimate speech, actually, if I'm not mistaken, was that delivered by the Senate minority leader, minority leader certainly no liberal, Everett Dirksen, rock-bound conservative who gives a speech in which he says, you know, for some ideas, the time has come. Well, the time has come for this. And it's one thing to hear Hubert Humphrey say that. It's another thing to hear Everett Dirksen say. So, yes, there was consensus. There was a sense of we, do, we disagree on the, on the uh, means, but we have a general sense of where we want, what we want in the ends. That's not true. Now, and now, uh, I mean, you know, people ask me, and we'll probably talk about this. Edward Kennedy was a guy who operated in a Republican Senate for a good deal of his, right. of his I mean, career. There, there, are, there was certainly at different points, whether we're talking about Tip O'Neill, whether we're talking about um, Edward Kennedy, whether we're talking about um, you know, a whole range of individuals mm -hmm. who were pragmatically able to get things done, whether it's in the House or the Senate, yes. because there was less, I'm just going to simplify it to less polarization, it's, there was more of a middle. That um, simplification perhaps. is accurate. Um, you know, Edward Kennedy, when, whenever Edward Kennedy would begin, uh, after he'd introduced a piece of legislation, would begin the campaign to pass that legislation, all he cared about was results. And, and I, I would add this, when we talk about the impact that Edward Kennedy has had on American life, he submitted roughly, or sponsored roughly 2,500 pieces of legislation. You know, most senators, if they're lucky, if they pass one piece, yeah. And, you know, a good many of them don't sponsor any pieces. He sponsored those, was the main sponsor. He passed over 700 pieces of legislation. Many of them, many of them significant. But when he'd submit legislation, he'd sit down with his staff, and his first order to them was, find me a Republican. Yeah. Right. It was always, find me a Republican to co-sponsor the bill 
so that we could get it through the Senate. Again, Joe Biden seemed to have that same attitude when he, <laughs> when he, when he ran for president of the presidency and learned very quickly that there are no Republicans. <laughs> and I don't care how good Edward Kennedy was as a master of the Senate, and we may talk about the fact that I think he surpassed Lyndon Johnson as a master of the Senate. But if Edward Kennedy were in the Senate today and he said to his staff, find a Republican, they'd laugh in his face. Are you, giving, are you kidding me? Find me a Republican. To do what? <laughs> well, we'll see in January how much of that plays out or if the numbers are just a tad enough different to see a return to some level of compromise. Eternal optimism, I know. But, uh, but let's go back to Ted Kennedy throughout this period uh, personally. Um, he, as we've talked about before, we find him uh, both a, a flawed person, Absolutely. Um, but equally able to lead because of that. Um, yes. History will judge. Yeah, well, go it's ahead. interesting that you say that. I, I just want, because of that, because of you that. say he was a flawed person, yeah. but was able to lead. Now, we often think, well, you know, you're flawed, but you're able to lead in spite of that. Mm. But I love the way, because that's how I frame it in the book. Mm. Yeah. You know, I believe that, that fallibility is a predicate uh -huh. for greatness. Right. Uh, most people would not believe that, and this is one of the most fallible you know, politicians that you will ever find yeah. in terms of his personal life. But I, I say that because um, you know, I believe that an individual who is as fallible as Edward Kennedy mm -hmm. was, uh, is someone who also, I mean, you can, your fallibility can develop in many different ways, mm -hmm. but one of the ways in which it can develop is the way it developed for Edward Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And it developed in terms of empathy. Mm -hmm. He understood his own weaknesses. Uh, in some ways, he sought his own weaknesses. I make that claim in both volumes, mm -hmm. that this was a man who flagellated himself all the time. Mm -hmm. He never felt he was good enough. Now, you never think of the Kennedys in those terms because for Joseph Kennedy, this was anathema. Hmm. The Kennedys are always the best. There's never a second. I mean, this is like the Kennedy mantra. Hmm. Kennedys never cry. Kennedys never finish second. You know, that's, that's and, and Ted, right. Ted did not right. live up to those expectations. But it's because even within his own family yeah. that he was the least of the Kennedys, yeah. at least as far as the Kennedys were concerned, yeah that he did develop this empathy. He could understand what it was like. So, so do, does, it, does it fall to him to carry on that legacy for that point of time? And does he choose that? Or does he feel he has no choice? No, he chooses it. I mean, a lot of things in, in Ted Kennedy's life are forced upon him. There's no question about that. Even when he ran for the Senate, mm. you know, Joe Kennedy said, this is, there's a succession. I even have a chapter in volume one called The Succession. Obviously, Joe Jr. was supposed to be the right. President of the United States. He's killed during World War II. Now, John Kennedy, who had no political aspirations whatsoever, and actually, to be perfectly honest, had one of the worst political temperaments that one could possibly imagine. Uh -huh. And he just, he was, you know, John Kennedy was a very different kind of guy. Mm. Uh, but now, he has no choice because it's the family, <laughs> it's the family legacy. Now you're gonna be a politician and you're gonna run for president. Mm. And then of course, when, when he dies, it falls to Robert Kennedy. Mm. And when Robert Kennedy dies, it falls to, mm. to Ted. Right. So yes, in a sense, it's forced upon him. But also the thing is the Kennedys are so tight. Mm. You know, it, it's the Kennedys develop, you know, it's the Kennedys against the world. Mm. I mean, that's how all of this kind of develops. Mm. I mean, it's the Kennedy family, Irish Catholics, always condescended to, always looked down upon, at least that's how they saw it. Mm. So it's their, they have to, they have to conquer. Right. I mean, the, they, the concept of the, the underdog from Martha's Vineyard is kind yeah, of a little it's, of an, uh, it's, it's crazy. Uh, right. <laughs> but, but, but that's exactly, I tell a story in volume one. Uh, but this, this I, I think, has reverberations throughout uh, mm. the, the entire, entire Kennedy story. Rose is in a car where John and one of his Harvard uh, friends, mm. they're driving up from Harvard to Cape Cod. And Rose, now this is, this is, remember, this is one of the richest families in America. You know, Joe Kennedy got his money out of the stock market right before the, the Great Depression. One of the richest families in America. And Rose turns to the, the friend, who's a Protestant, and she says, when are you Protestants ever going to accept us Catholics? Uh, I mean, that, 
That sense of umbrage, that sense of umbrage runs through the Kennedy family. Mm. And it's one of the impulses for the Kennedy's embrace of the underdog, of the marginalized, of the voiceless and powerless and all of that. But when, when John and, and Robert are gone, Ted, and he, and he says this in a speech, a famous speech in Worcester, it's called the Fallen Standard speech. Uh, Ted, you know, when, when Bobby dies, I mean, Ted is absolutely shattered, completely shattered. Uh, his whole life is, is gone. You know, the Kennedys are all dependent on one another. And, uh, and now he's the last surviving brother. And in Worcester, he gives a speech when he comes out of hiding, so to speak. And he gives a speech in that, that August, which is several months, you know, uh, Bobby dies in June. And he says, it, it, now I pick up the fallen standard. I mean, he, he makes a public declaration. I will pick this up and I will carry on my brother's uh, project. But here's the interesting thing too, David, that I, as I see it, is that, you know, we tend to read Jack and Bobby into Ted. Mm. That is, you know, he becomes a greater figure because, you know, his brothers were so big, were, were you know, in, in, the, in the political, in, in political magnitude. Mm. But, um, and we tend to read their, their sort of their liberalism into mm. Ted. But, but Jack and Bobby were nowhere near as liberal right. as Ted became. Right. Right. And I think what happens is that now we read Ted back into them. And they become much more liberal in retrospect than uh, particularly John. I mean, John was not a particularly liberal guy. I mean, uh, he, he becomes this champion of universal health care for yes, most of this period. and From 69 on. Right. Um, and that's just one example, I think, of having uh, you know, a greater and deep attunement to the actual progressive values mm. that, that, yes. that, that some of us might subscribe to. Um, but I want st to stay on this, this, this contrast of opposites between someone who has flaws, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's enough lots of life around them for mm -hmm. that to be, be, be absolutely true. Um, there is this humility and empathy that you've, you've just talked about a moment ago. And yet, he also runs for president himself in the yes, 1980s. Does. Put, put that, I mean, we're not, okay. we're not, we can't cover 1800 pages in, in a, or even a, a half of that we'll in, in we'll one hour. Another session now. <laughs> um, but I do think there are some key moments that I want to give people a sense of in your work mm. that then they can pick up the, the, the books themselves. So this is one key moment that I'd love you to make sense it absolutely of. Absolutely is a key moment. Why does he run for the presidency? Right. I mean, the assumption is, you know, after Bobby's death, that he will always run for the presidency, that at some point, He's going to be a candidate himself, and Chappaquiddick, in some ways, you know, sinks that. Right. I mean, his candidacy goes off the bridge with, you know, with the car, right. uh, and indeed that that does, you know, uh, temper his his presidential aspirations. Right. But now in 1980, he takes on an incumbent Democratic president right. in a primary. Uh, now. Some people attribute that, and one of them is Jimmy Carter, mm -hmm. to just pure ambition. Mm -hmm. You know, he, this, this man is so driven by ambition, you know, it's in the Kennedys, uh, and, uh, you know, he's just going to, he, there's no reason for him to go after me. I'm a Democrat myself, uh, but this is, this is opportunism. Bobby Kennedy was always called an opportunist. Uh, now Ted inherits that as he inherits many other things from his brothers. It's, I think, a... a, a terribly wrong uh, characterization. Uh, and it shows, as has happened in so many aspects of Carter's life, a complete misunderstanding mm -hmm. of, uh, of the political situation and of Ted Kennedy mm -hmm. personally. Ted Kennedy runs against Jimmy Carter uh, because he feels Ted has picked up this mantle. Mm -hmm. Ted is the leading liberal. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone looks to Ted to keep the liberal engine mm -hmm. moving. And Ted looks at Jimmy Carter, who has a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate. He's a Democrat, obviously. And Ted's assumption is, well, now finally, finally, the Democratic project, which is the liberal project, is going to start moving. And instead, Jimmy Carter, 
and one can make a case for Jimmy Carter. I'm not going to. That's a different you know, book. Right? That's a different story. Yeah, that right. there are books actually right. that make that case. I don't. I'm not going to make it here. I don't. I don't want to dump on Carter or support him or anything else. But Jimmy Carter becomes an austerity president. He becomes Republican light. His main goal as president is to shrink the deficit and to make sure that government doesn't oversell itself. Uh, now. Carter would say and did say th those were the times you're not going to win the presidency if you don't do that the American people want austerity Ted Kennedy says poppycock the American people want national health care that's what they want they want a, a jobs plan they want and he had a whole array of things but but when it came to Carter Ted's feeling was there was one institution in this country one institution in this country that is going to advocate for the poor, for the marginalized, for the black, for the Hispanic, for the immigrant. One institution, that's the Democratic Party. And you're not going to do it? You're not going to do it, Jimmy Carter? I'm going to do it. The breaking point is health care. That's the breaking point. And this, this debate between the two of them goes on for years. Years. And what is the breaking point? The breaking point is Carter will not advocate for a national health care plan. Right. And he finally does it, you know, he, he's compelled to do it during the presidential campaign mm -hmm. because UAW mm -hmm. basically forces them to do it, United Auto Workers. And they say, you know, if you're not going to advocate for health care, you know, we're not going to advocate for you. Mm -hmm. And he does it also because Ted Kennedy, who did this with Richard Nixon as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ted Kennedy will push and push and push and compel his adversary mm -hmm. to co-opt him. So finally, Carter concedes, but Carter says, you know, we'll have, this is how we're going to do it. We'll have a health care plan that is phased in. We'll have phase one, and then we'll have phase two, and then we'll have phase three, and we'll, we'll phase it in. And Kennedy says, man, you do not understand how the Senate works, which is true. No, there's no phase in. Well, unless you phase something in, you'll never get to two. Right. You'll phase out one. That's how the Senate works. As soon as the Republicans get any power, health care will be ended. You do it all at once, mm -hmm. and you've got the clout to do it. Mm -hmm. Do it now. Mm -hmm. And when Carter refused to do that, mm -hmm. Kennedy said that's it. Now, there were other, either they were temperamentally the most dissimilar people. You know, Kennedy is gregarious and he's a backslapper, and Carter is the most sanctimonious, you know, cold. I mean, he's ice cold. He's a killer. I mean, he's just a killer. I mean, so there were those things going. But basically, yeah. and, and you also, I mean, Ted Kennedy felt when Jimmy Carter gave his famous so called Malay speech, mm -hmm. Ted Kennedy watched that speech where he says, you know, the trouble is. The American people were feeling malaise, all this stuff. And Ted Kennedy watches that speech. And he says, this guy cannot be president of the United States. Can you, and he says this, he says, can you imagine my brothers giving a speech like this? You know, you're, you're all sick. You know, you're just not doing the right thing. Something's wrong with you. Can you imagine a Kennedy giving, a, no, a Kennedy would go and say, come on now, let's, you know, let's do what we need to do. And, and those things determined Kennedy's run, a tragic run <laughs> in, in terms of his own politics uh, and his own political career, tragic run in 1980. Right. I mean, I think, I think one, one of his speeches from that period that I'm most familiar with, his concession speech, is one of the best speeches he ever gave. One of the greatest speeches in, in American political history. Right. Uh, the, speech, the, the concession speech that he gives you know, at the Democratic National Convention, which you know, is a speech that is so resounding that even the political commentators were saying if they took the vote for the presidency now for the nomination, Kennedy would beat Carter. I mean, that place went crazy because Carter gave the very kind of, excuse me, Kennedy gave the very kind of speech that he had said his brothers would have given, a rousing speech, a speech that the dream shall never die. Right. Well, Carter was determined to put a stake in the heart of that tree. <laughs> um, I'm, you know, l let me ask you to pick maybe a uh, you know Republican antagonist from mm -hmm. this period, so that we can just get a sense yes. of contrast 
Uh, that mm. was Kennedy versus Carter. That's right. Uh, you know, so either whether in someone else in the Senate or or one of the later presidents, the, the Reagan period was particularly problematic it in was. many ways, uh, especially given what would have been happening to the liberal quote unquote agenda mm. during that time politically. You know, there's there's one Ted Kennedy in, on the liberal scene, and there are a lot of antagonists because the conservative movement is. Uh, is going gangbusters. Uh, but in that period, I mean, I, I think it's unquestionable that, you know, Ronald Reagan is the main antagonist. Mm -hmm. And and that is, is some ways, I mean, the story that this book tells is a story that I felt, you know, and this is one of the reasons I, I wrote it, frankly, mm -hmm. um, that I, I felt never had really been told. Mm -hmm. We always look at the Reagan period in, in terms of politics, mm -hmm. we look at the Reagan period as it's another, uh, you know, wave election, mm -hmm. the 1980 election, which it really wasn't, mm -hmm. comparable to 1932. It wasn't a wave election. Here's the thing, uh, just, just parenthetically about the 1980 election. The Gallup poll had Jimmy Carter up among registered voters by eight points going into the final weekend. Jimmy Carter was up by eight points. Mm -hmm. And, and we Ronald thought our Reagan, faith in polls was a modern that's, problem, that's, right? No, now. no, no, no. And, and, and Reagan wins by 10. Mm. Uh, now, the, the, the reason most people, most analysts say that happened is because everybody hated both candidates. I mean, Reagan was not popular. Reagan was very, very unpopular. And Carter was certainly not popular. He was very unpopular. And finally, the American people, those who came into that final weekend with you know either indecisive or you know their their decision was not uh, had not solidified yet said you know we know what Carter's going to do and he's been terrible mm -hmm. so we might as well try this guy mm -hmm. so you know this idea of Reagan being popular and Reagan having a wave election all that stuff that that was not a wave election if you look at the uh, the demographics mm -hmm. there actually the the if if anyone created a new Republican majority, it was Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon really got, he created Nixon Democrats long before there was anything like Reagan Democrats. But here's the thing about the story I say that I want to tell here is it's not political. And neither one of these books are fundamentally political in this sense. Ted Kennedy was morally driven. Ronald Reagan was morally driven. It's just a completely antithetical kind of morality. The story of what happened to liberalism has much more to do with morality than it does with politics. Because this, what, I, what, I, what I talk about in, in volume one, and I pick up again in volume two, is this, that the real question uh, uh, for, for that liberals have to contend with is not why liberalism declined, but why it lasted as long as it did. Because liberalism is the, uh, I mean, the, the programmatic liberalism is the, uh, the, the result of the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt and programs that were designed to help the American people who desperately needed help. But now, after World War II, when the economy in America is largely flourishing, despite a couple of recessions along the way, uh, Americans, whether they realize it or not, don't think that they need these kind of liberal programs. I mean, they assume that, I mean, they, 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 take, they take Social Security for granted. Later, they'll take Medicare for granted. I mean, the, the, the famous line of that Americans, you know, senior citizens do not believe in socialized medicine. They do not believe that government should have anything to do with their medicine uh, and medical care. And then you ask them, well, do you believe in Medicare? Of course I believe in Medicare. Right, right, right. You know, it, Medicare government out of my Medicare, right. That's right, yeah. don't touch my Medicare. Yeah. So what, what happens is that, that when Americans no longer believe fundamentally in the programmatic liberalism, you have to ask, it keeps on going. It doesn't, that's not the end of liberalism. Liberalism has a much longer run. Right up through, one could say Richard Nixon, because so much of what Richard Nixon does is a reaction to Ted Kennedy. I mean, you know, look at Richard Nixon's programs as president. I mean, he talked a, a 
awful conservative game, but he had OSHA, he had the Environmental Protection Agency. These are all the things that Richard Nixon did because Richard Nixon was contending with liberal opposition. Yeah. So why did it last so long? My answer is that it lasted as long as it did because liberalism had something that conservatism did not have. And to this day, conservatives do not have it, which is moral authority. And so the project of conservatives was to destroy the moral authority of liberalism. And what that required is not a political, because politics comes and goes, and that, but the conservative ascendancy in America has been going on now for a long time. Arthur Schlesinger Jr. said that you know, politics changes every 30 years. Well, it hasn't changed every 30 years now. And what, what Reagan did is he recalibrated American morality. We had a morality of compassion, tolerance, decency, general kindness. It was a kind of golden rule morality, and that fueled liberalism. It's the morality of liberalism. I mean, let's be honest about it. That's the morality of liberalism. Ronald Reagan and the conservatives knew that they had to post something in opposition at the same time that they were destroying that. And what they posed is a morality of self-reliance, of loyalty, hard work, honesty, a different kind of morality entirely, but one that is devoid of compassion. You know, you, you, you're on your own. Government shouldn't exist at all as far as the conservatives were in, in today feel. It shouldn't even exist in any way, but it certainly shouldn't exist to help people. And I, I think this line of Mario Cuomo's, it, to my, in, in my estimation, kind of summarizes it all. Reagan's main accomplishment was in making the denial of compassion respectable. Because that's modern conservatism. Modern conservatism is in making the denial of compassion respectable. And I'm not just speaking as some harebrained, you know, democratic operative. I'm not. I'm a historian. But you can't read. You cannot go through the period that this book covers without asking yourself, okay, Kennedy proposes health care. Republicans almost uniformly oppose it. Why? Why wouldn't you want people to, who, who don't have right. health care why would you want to deny them that? But one could go point by point. Mm -hmm. Kennedy proposes again and again and again raising the minimum wage. By how much? By quarters. Not by, you know, ten dollars an hour, mm -hmm. by quarters. Mm -hmm. Republicans uniformly, uniformly oppose it. Oppose those extra quarters. Mm -hmm. Because the minimum wage is below the poverty line, Ted Kennedy says again and again and again. Hmm. And again, I, I could go on. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. So, yeah. um, so I want to I want to come back to the, the the. So there are two tropes there. There's a there's an extreme right wing trope and an hmm. extreme left wing trope that that I want to touch on in a second. Okay. But but um, on the healthcare agenda component. Hmm. There's a rather, um, uh, you know, a tender section where you're discussing Ted Kennedy, Barack Obama interactions around yeah. passing of the torch around this. Yes. And it is true that the Obama administration got the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. passed. Mm -hmm. um, so is, was that a checking the box for Ted Kennedy, or does it still fall short of what he had hoped for? And how do we put that, that well, much together? First of all, Ted Kennedy was a pragmatist. Yeah. So though Ted Kennedy opposed Jimmy Carter on the phase in, he opposed him on the phase in not because he, he wasn't willing to accept a compromise, mm -hmm. but because he thought this compromise will tank healthcare entirely. You know, he, Ted Kennedy would always say, you know, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. You know, 50% uh, of a loaf is better than no loaf at all. He, right. Those were things he would say all the time. You know, he was very much, mm -hmm. you know, you think of him as an ideologue. Mm -hmm. And he was not an ideologue. He was a very pragmatic kind of politician. Mm -hmm. I have one chapter called, uh, We Need the Results. That's a quote of his. We need the results. I don't care about all the other yeah. stuff. 
give me results. That's why I have passed 750 pieces mm -hmm. of, of legislation. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, to health care, no, he was willing to accept the compromises. Uh, but he wanted it, he wanted universal health care. That's the one thing. You know, there were all sorts of compromises in the mechanisms sure. of it. But he wanted to make sure that the 15% of Americans who had no health care hmm. would get their health care. Mm -hmm. You know, it was interesting at the time, one of the greatest opponents of his during the, the Clinton health care hmm. plan was Pat Moynihan, hmm. uh, who was the, at that time the chairman of the Finance Committee hmm. and was... And was you know, he had a great responsibility in making certain that Clinton didn't get his health care plan passed. And uh, basically, Moynihan's idea was, it's 15%. The American people don't give a crap about the other 15%, so long as the 85% have theirs. They don't care. Huh. And Ted Kennedy's idea was, it's the 15% we, we, that need us, right. not the 85%. Right. I represent the 15%. Right. So yes, I mean, he checked that box, yeah. uh, but remember, he also had to, in a way, he had to force Obama into that. Mm -hmm. Obama was, was waffling mm -hmm. when he entered the presidency mm -hmm. as to what he needed to tackle. Mm -hmm. Did he need to tackle the recession right. first right. and just pour everything into that? Right. Or did he, did he need to tackle health care, which would be the last best opportunity to do it? Mm -hmm. Ted Kennedy twisted his arm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Ted Kennedy had, had a lot of chits to collect yeah. because, you know, it, it, we forget now, but, you know, when, when Hillary was running against o Obama, uh, Ted Kennedy came in on January 28th and endorsed Obama. And that was a critical point in that race. And he endorsed Obama. He said, and I, you know, Kennedy seldom lied. You know, he, he was, <laughs> what he said publicly was pretty much what he said privately. But he said... You know, this is the closest thing to my brother, hmm. meaning John, yeah. that we've ever had running for the presidency. Hmm. And it was Caroline who first brought Obama to Ted's attention in presidential terms. Obviously, they worked together in the Senate, and sometimes we're, we're on uh, opposite sides. I mean, Ted thought Obama was a little arrogant. Uh, but, but Caroline said to him, my kids watch him speak and they love him mm. and when kennedy passed that torch i mean he was passing the torch right. and he told obama that yeah. you know i'm giving you this i'm giving you the kennedy legacy now picking up the fallen standard yeah. well i'm handing that standard to you uh -huh. and obama said and i have this in the book you know obama said oh my god you know this is this is a tremendous responsibility to take the entire Kennedy legacy, right. and now I own it. Right. Right. And it's partly that ownership that led to Obamacare. Yeah. Because Ted Kennedy gets out of his deathbed, mm -hmm. out of his deathbed mm -hmm. that March, to go to the White House for a meeting that Obama has convened mm -hmm. of healthcare specialists and others uh, to move, to advance his, uh, his, his Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And Ted Kennedy gets up you know, enfeebled, barely able to walk, and basically gives the charge to those, to those forces to pass this thing, to pass it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, it, it remains an open question as to how uh, progressive, liberal, what we ended up with truly is. Mm -hmm. um, probably another mm -hmm. topic for another day. But Kennedy would have said, I mean, that, that's an interesting point, because again and again and again, yeah. You know, there are opponents, particularly among unions and whatever, who say, uh, and on immigration, I have a long, you know, long passage on Kennedy trying to yep. pass an immigration reform. And, you know, some of the, the immigration advocates say, you're going to sell us out, you're going to sell us out. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Kennedy's whole modus operandi was, once we get something, mm -hmm. once we get something, I'll get you the rest. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, right. that was really the way he, right. he operated is, right. let me get something and I'll get you the rest. I mean, it's an interesting point about how to compromise between these tropes of, 
you know, either, yeah, everybody can just basically pull themselves up by their own bootstrings mm -hmm. if they have the right access to opportunity versus, no, we need real deep social safety nets mm -hmm. for many, whether it's the 15% yeah. or others. And so that approach to compromise is a very interesting uh, methodology. But, and, and how did he do it? This is the interesting thing. <laughs> I mean, he's yeah. a master, I call him a right. master of the Senate, and he is a master of the Senate. Uh, I think, you know, he, he's a very different master of the Senate than Lyndon Johnson, the so-called original master of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Because Lyndon Johnson uses the hard power mm -hmm. of intimidation. Mm -hmm. But Kennedy uses the soft power of sociability. Right. And Kennedy understands the chemistry of the Senate. Mm -hmm. He understands that kindness and, you know, kind of decency, uh, and favors and even thank you notes right. will get you a long way. Almost no one in the Senate, and I even mean the, the, some of the most hardened conservatives mm. hated Ted Kennedy. Mm. <clears throat> they used him mm. in their fundraising and they joke about it. You know, I'm gonna send out a flyer that says how much I hate you. And Ted would say, boy, I hope you get a lot of money on it. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was a sense of sociability that Ted Kennedy had yeah. that his fellow senators, yeah. even those on the other side of the aisle, yeah. uh, appreciated. Yeah. And, and I say, that can't be done now. Yeah. But here's where I think Ted Kennedy is relevant. Yeah. <clears throat> He's not relevant necessarily in, in being able to use those instruments sure. to gain passage of legislation that he was able to gain passage of legislation in, in a Republican Senate. But Ted Kennedy had something else. And it's, it's something I've alluded to here. Ted Kennedy had moral fervor. When Ted Kennedy took the floor to advance a piece of legislation, it was a moral, not a political decision. He gained nothing political, nothing. Ted Kennedy didn't need that. There was only one competitive Senate race that he ran, and that was against Romney in 94. It was the only competitive race he ran. <clears throat> Ted Kennedy always took the moral position. This is the right thing to do. And that cowered a lot of senators. And I, I, I am reminded of a line that Joe Biden said when he was at the dedication of the Edward Kennedy Institute. Hmm. Uh, and this goes to his methodology. He said, people didn't want to feel small in front of him, mm -hmm. even when they were small. And, and one of the things you read repeatedly among his Senate colleagues were the ways in which he used his own moral authority, mm. not in his personal life, but as a senator, mm. because everybody knew he was sincere. He didn't do this because the unions were going to back him or because he was going to get black votes or whatever. No, they knew that he did it because it was the right thing to do. And there are issues like the Children's Health Insurance Program, <clears throat> which was a, a, probably his, the, the, the fundamentally the biggest thing that Ted Kennedy did, which was pass a program that provided health insurance for children whose parents made too much money to qualify for Medicaid, but too little to buy them health insurance. Ted Kennedy got that right. and got millions, millions of children into that program. How did he do it? There's a story behind that, which if we, we may get to it, because Orrin Hatch was his co-sponsor. You couldn't find a more conservative senator than Orrin Hatch. Right. And Orrin Hatch was a co-sponsor on that bill. But one of the ways he did it, one of the ways he did it is because it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk that language anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's language that we don't use politically. We don't even use it morally. What's the right thing to do? Yeah, I mean, th this, <clears throat> this um, topic of the interconnectivity between uh, moral philosophy and political philosophy, uh, which we, we have from the Greeks, mm -hmm. is lost completely in, in, in this framing. And yet, losing it, we lose everything, in my estimation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience that I want to throw at us right. in, in, uh, in, in the remaining time. And uh, you know, this, this ability that you're talking about of getting things done, interacting with others, um, there were segregationists in Congress in, mm -hmm. in the House and Senate during this time. There I'm thinking sure of Strom Thurmond in particular mm -hmm. during this period. How did he get along with, with them? I'm paraphrasing a question that we, we well, got. Well, the, the, the single most, 
he, got, he did get along with Strom Thurmond because they, he f tried to find common ground and yeah. it certainly wasn't going to be on civil rights. The more interesting case mm. is the case of James Eastland. Mm. Why more interesting? Because Eastland was the chairman for some 23 years, I believe, of the Judiciary Committee. Okay. And it was through the Judiciary Committee that all civil rights legislation had to flow. Right. And Kennedy sat on the Judiciary Committee, ultimately became chairman of it. So he had to find some modus vivendi with James Eastland. Mm. Well, the way he did it was, you know, through sociability. You know, he'd go to Eastland's office and they drink bourbons and, you know, they, you know, kibitz with one another, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Eastland wasn't going to change yeah. his view of segregation mm -hmm. and Kennedy wasn't going to change his. But there were other issues. I mean, Kennedy would fight Eastland mm -hmm. and, and he would do everything he could to round up and he did over time, this was one of the things he did in the Senate, you know, he, there, there was basically a young liberal cabal that mm -hmm. formed in the Senate that Ted Kennedy was really the kind of leader of, mm -hmm. and that the job of that cabal was to oppose the Southern Bulls, like Eastland and Stennis and, you know, Thurmond and all of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing then is, you, you, Kennedy's idea was you never take anything personally. Mm -hmm. That's how you lose. Mm. Kennedy never took anything personally when they assaulted him or insulted him. Mm. And he never took anything personally when he angrily, mm. you know, in political terms, angrily opposed Eastland. Mm. When Eastland said, you know, the Judiciary Committee is where civil rights legislation goes to die. Mm -hmm. That's what he, that's, mm. that was his declaration. Well, Kennedy was making sure that it, that's where it goes to live and to move on to the Senate. But the thing was, in those days, mm -hmm. now everything is Armageddon right. in the Senate. Everything. And there personal. Is, and personal. There's no friendships right. across the aisle. In those days, right. there were friendships across the aisle. And, you know, they, they sort of, Kennedy was like a, a, a little pet. I have an interview that I, that I have of Eastland talking about Kennedy. Mm. It's a, it's, I got it from the James Eastland papers. It's, and uh, he says, oh, he's a nice boy. He's a good boy. You know, he's a bright boy. I like that boy. I mean, that's, now that's, that's Eastland talking about basically how Ted Kennedy worked him. <laughs> but Ted Kennedy worked everybody. The difference was that he was sincere in working. I mean, you know, he, I don't think he liked Eastland particularly, uh, but he certainly didn't like his politics. But, you know, he was working him because he believed in the comedy of the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if there are a couple of questions <clears throat> from the audience, we, we can take those. We can also uh, take them from online if we have one. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to hear you and uh, Robert Caro debate um, who the, the true master of the Senate was, maybe <laughs> uh, then in the future. Just curious, <laughs> health care comes up, and of course that was something that was so close to uh, Senator Kennedy's heart. Did he ever express regret or, or wonder about what could have been had he accepted yes. Nixon's proposal in, in 74 before Watergate and, and um, it sounded like that Kennedy thought that after the midterms and with the Democratic administration, he'd be able mm -hmm. to get a much better plan across than what Nixon ultimately offered. And of course, history proves that incorrect. So curious if there's a great that question. Up. And, and you're absolutely right. Although the only thing you're wrong on is that Kennedy didn't feel that after the midterms, we would get a better deal. It was others particularly, you know, the unions who felt, you know, Nixon's dead now. Can you imagine the health care plan we're going to get? Kennedy's lifelong regret was not striking a deal with Nixon. Nixon was desperate because of Watergate. So what did Nixon do? He proposed a, a, a quite progressive health care plan. Kennedy simultaneously Nixon was almost always reactive, and that health care plan, by the way, was a reaction to the health care plan that Kennedy had proposed. Uh, so simultaneously, they were working on these health care plans, and as I point out in volume one, they were working together. Their staffs were working together on, on health care, on a health care plan. But there was tremendous pressure, both from the Democratic Party and, as I said, from the unions, not to make a deal with Nixon because Nixon would get the credit. And that's exactly why Nixon was doing this. Nixon could have cared less about health care. You know, he didn't give a damn. 
you know, he, what he wanted to do is get something that would keep him in office. Uh, Kennedy always said, I had this chance and I lost it. Basically, he caved to the unions. Uh, although I have a, a, a story in, in the book where the, the union leaders come in to Kennedy to pressure him. And Kennedy says, uh, so you, you think you're going to get a better health care plan when, when Nixon's out of office. And he, he takes out the, uh, the congressional uh, directory and he goes down the list of senators and congressmen and particularly chairmen. And he says, so-and-so. You think he's going to be voted out of office? No, he's staying in office. He's not going to vote for you. So-and-so. You think he's going to be voted out of office? No, you guys don't understand how this works. I'm going to tell you how it works. These guys are going to be in here. The same guys who are opposing this are going to oppose it then. You're not going to have any easier time of it. And they stormed out of his office. Uh, but you know, Kennedy understood the mechanisms. Uh, and again, that was, the, that was one of the few times that he blew it, that he felt he blew it. Hmm. He could have had a deal with, with Nixon in all probability. And that would have been a progressive health care plan that he would have then built on. Do, do we have any online questions? Um, nope. Nope. Um, let me just take one that I had from earlier, and then we'll, we'll come to you. Um, th there's a couple of questions that relate to the evolution of conservatism during this mm. period. Um, I think in preparation, you and I you know, were talking about what we could argue mm. about is where to start the story yes. around this. Um, mm. You talked this evening earlier uh, the role Reagan's shift had. Yes. Um, there's an argument that would say it's the post-Nixon era that starts the, oh, I would, the thread. I would, well, I think, so, I, I mean, I would make a, a, an argument, and in fact, uh, <clears throat> my, the, the book that I'm working on now may, may make this, that the roots of this go in, when the country was founded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you want to find right. where the roots of all of this are, right. and even the roots of, of Trumpism, you have to go way back in American history. But in terms of modern American politics, uh, it begins with Nixon. Yeah. Nixon was a genius of resentment. I mean, a genius at it. And what Nixon understood is how to, I mean, many politicians, most politicians do this. They project themselves on the country, and the country becomes them. But Nixon understood his own resentments. He felt that you know, he was always condescended to, always looked down upon. He didn't go to Harvard Law School. He had to go to Duke Law School. You know, I mean, it was all that kind of stuff. He wasn't a Kennedy. He wasn't rich like the Kennedys. No, he's a poor kid. I mean, the, the resentments just seethed in him. They, they burned a hole in him. And, and he projected those resentments on Americans and said, Americans are all resentful too. Hmm. And they resent liberalism. Hmm. In this, he was right. It's like Trump. You know, I mean, Trump understands all the negatives of the human soul. He doesn't understand any of the positives. But I have a chapter title in volume one, mm -hmm. which is a, a line from Richard Nixon, sitting around with one of his cronies. And this pertaining to liberalism. And he's kind of smugly says, people don't want to be improved. See, that's his, that's his, his that's a conservative vision, basically, mm -hmm. is people don't want to be improved. And if you go out there and try and improve them by, by appealing to their better angels, you're a loser. You're going to lose. Because people don't want that. And indeed, when the backlash against civil rights, I said earlier that there was almost unanimous support for the civil rights movement in that moral crease. That's gone in a couple of years. By the time Nixon comes around, Nixon knows how to work it. He knows how to work it to get people to turn on black Americans. Hmm. It's the Southern strategy. It's law and order. Law and order means, of course, you know, beating up on blacks. I mean, it's, a, it's that whole thing, because he gets it. He gets that there's this resentment. Mm -hmm. And if you pick at it, if you pick at it enough, you can destroy the liberal project. Mm -hmm. You can destroy compassion. Reagan doesn't do that finally. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he does it with a smile, because mm -hmm. Reagan is not a resentful human being. Mm -hmm. You know, Reagan, has a, you know, Reagan is, is like Ted Kennedy in terms of his personality. Right. He's a gregarious right. guy with a smile, and he puts the smile on conservatism, you know, and which Nixon 
Nixon put the frown on conservatism. And well, that's why Reagan is more successful in sure. vital analysis. Well, I mean, and, and mm. I, I don't like to suggest equivalence when it comes mm. to these issues, but we mm. have examples on the right of almost deifying Ronald Reagan, yes. and we have experience of, on the left, almost deifying some of the Kennedys in some ways as yes. well. So there are, there are you know, um, again, to use the trope word, uh, mm. you know, um, uh, uh, models where... But the difference is that yeah. one yeah. made the denial of compassion respectable, yeah. and the other tried to get the American people to embrace compassion. Right. So those things are not equivalent to Exactly. Me. And I keep on saying that, you know, it, it, it's, you know, that's why we can't have this discussion really, because we live in a world of moral both siderisms. We talk about political both siderism, and finally it took the press, you know, Donald Trump and three years in office, for them to finally say, you know what? The Republican Party and the Democratic Party aren't equivalent. No, the Republican Party is, is you know, anti-democratic party that does not believe in any of the principles of this country. And the Democratic Party still does. But moral both siders, and we still have. Mm. This idea, we have guys like Jonathan Haidt, who come out with, why good people can disagree? No, you know, I don't know that you're, you're a good person, mm. in my estimation, mm. if you deny compassion. And if your main mm. moral precept is self-reliance. Mm. No, I don't believe that. Mm. Now that's just me, mm. but I don't believe that. And I think if you believe it, if you believe that these are equivalent moralities, it's interesting when you look at Jonathan Haidt's categories. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a sociologist mm -hmm. who is big on morality and all this mm -hmm. stuff, but not in my sense. And, and his different moralities, he has a liberal morality and conservative morality. But you look at the categories of his conservative mm -hmm. morality, and it's self-reliance, hard work, loyalty, sanctity, by which he means the sanctity of a marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, you know, he goes through all that stuff. You know, when loyalty, disobedience is one of them. Mm -hmm. and, and I say, these are the things I expect from my dog, but not what I expect from human beings who are trying to be moral. Um, we'll give you the last question, and, um, and uh, other, I'm getting a, something from behind. It uh, really uh, impressed very deeply on me the way you said that the suppression of uh, compassion was made, uh, you know, respectable, mm -hmm. uh, which is like the rise of conservatism. What I want to know is, I mean, conservatism was always there in the fabric, and it, any part of the world, there are those with progressive thoughts, there are those who espouse a more conservative thing. Mm -hmm. But what began, or what was the inception of the end of decency? Uh, in you know American politics, like today, I am a very America loving, very happily uh, resident uh, Bostonian, originally from Pakistan, uh, a devout Muslim, also a homosexual. But I I don't feel that I really belong to the whole of America anymore. And so this whole country has basically sequestered and become the Northeast for me because okay, Boston, Providence, New York, maybe even Montreal, Toronto. I feel comfortable in the in, you know like this northeastern circuit but I'm terrified to go to like Georgia Texas Tennessee and this was never the case uh, I mean this was always a country was like you bring your diversity you bring your uh, other viewpoint you know if you read the founding fathers they were like you can stand on a pulpit and preach Mohammedanism in the same way that you can uh, Christianity and I just don't know where this turn happened that today someone can stand up and say you're not really you're not white you're not Christian you're not straight you don't don't belong in this country, and I don't want you in my part. Well, this is part of the moral recalibration that I talk about. Uh, that happened, you know, it's been happening for, you know, the last 60 years, longer than that, but politically speaking, for roughly the last 60 years. And I think you're, you're right. Um, but, you know, there, there are many sources for this, many sources for this. Uh, but when Ronald Reagan, you know, comes to the presidency, and forms an alliance with the evangelicals. Now Reagan is, not, is totally a religious. He's not a religious figure at all. I quote in, in this volume, I quote Charles Colson, when, when he asks Reagan, you know, are, are you born again? And, he, and Colson says, Reagan looked at me as if I was from Mars. He had no concept of what that even meant. But Reagan understood politically speaking that you, you, the alliance with the evangelicals who in the prior election had voted two thirds for Jimmy Carter now we're going to turn on Carter because Carter wanted the Internal Revenue Service. This is how these things turn in politics. This is, this is how evangelicals look at morality. Carter had the Internal Revenue Service deny their segregated schools uh, tax deduction, you know, the, the status of, uh, of tax uh, 
uh, tax deduction. So they turned on Carter, and they needed a, an ally, and so this became the alliance of, uh, of evangelicals and Reagan. But you know, this, this all gets kind of mixed up in a big stew, the, the stew of which is, you know, how do white supremacists, white Americans generally, you know, maintain their power in America? I mean, that's the story, that's the, that's the subtext mm -hmm. of American politics in, in the story I tell here. Mm -hmm. You know, Ted Kennedy is the advocate for the outsider. White outsiders, poor white outsiders, who ultimately turn on him, but, you know, blacks, immigrants, Hispanics, you know, gay, I mean, gays, Ted Kennedy is the, the senator who introduces the Ryan White AIDS Act. You know, and, uh, you know, he's, nobody in the Senate really cared. Nobody cared. Reagan didn't care, as we all know. Uh, Ted Kennedy was taught to care because he had, you know, uh, gay staffers. And they said, you know, you have, to, you have to be the advocate. Nobody else is going to be the advocate. And he did. He became the advocate. Moral leadership again. It's moral Neil, leadership. If you'd indulge me, there was a question at the very back that I had missed um, because I can't exactly see the top line. So we will take that question. And, you know, actually, Neil, on the, on the, in response to that last in, in, mm -hmm. interchange, there's writing in the book that I'd actually taken note of. Mm -hmm. You reference the fault lines that cracked open in the wake of the civil rights movement and Vietnam, that these were intentionally widened by Kennedy's Republican rivals to create a moral vision of America standing in direct opposition to once broadly shared commitments to racial justice and economic equality. So I think, I think yes. this, this thread is precisely what the book, book yes. is about. Exactly. Let us take the question. Uh, my question is, um, why did you choose to title the book against the wind. Um, is, is that the question? Yeah, I want you to answer it. I've thought considerably about it, but I want you to answer it. Well, uh, because Edward Kennedy, uh, understanding that the country is turning rightward, gives a speech uh, at the, there, there was a time, actually there were two of these, there were many Democratic conventions, midterm Democratic conventions. And in 1978, there was one in Memphis. And uh, Kennedy is speaking there. And Kennedy gives a speech. Uh, Carter's guys, Califano, who's the HEW secretary, are there as well. And they're going to be debating health care. And Kennedy gives a speech. It's a, very, a, a speech that's very moving, very powerful, had the delegates on their, on their feet. And in that, he says, again, addressing the whole conservatism, not only of Jimmy Carter, but of the nation generally, sometimes you have to sail against the wind. You know, it's not as if Ted Kennedy didn't understand the politics of what he was doing. The politics of what he was doing were very, very difficult. He stood alone in the Reagan administration. Kennedy is in the wilderness because he knows he can't pass anything. There are even, even trying to form alliances. Kennedy passes almost nothing but one big, big piece of legislation. There's one thing Ronald Reagan doesn't have. He has sociability, people love him, you know, he's got all that stuff. He knows how to put the, uh, 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 a, the right bow on the package. He does all of that, but he doesn't have morality. And you know what Reagan hates? He hates the idea of South African sanctions. So what does Ted Kennedy do? Ted Kennedy embraces the role of, of being the leader of getting sanctions on South Africa. And not only does he embrace that role, but through his moral authority, he convinces enough Republicans to override Ronald Reagan's veto of South African sanctions. So he knows, you know, the wind is blowing, there's a gale wind blowing in his face. For, the, for basically like the last, what, 30 years of his career. A gale wind blowing in his face. So he embraces the idea, embraces the idea that he has to sail against the wind. But most politicians won't. 
Most politicians won't because the sail against the wind means they're going to lose an election. And Ted Kennedy wasn't going to lose an election except, as I say, 1994 when he, when he thought he might lose and he wound up not. But and as a, as a sailor himself, an apt metaphor, that's exactly, for sure. Well, that's why he uses the right. metaphor. I mean, everything, sailing metaphors are, <laughs> there's a plethora of sailing metaphors in all of, because he sees the sea as one of the great metaphors of life. Hmm. Uh, but also he sees the sea as understanding the scale of life, that politics are insignificant hmm. in the larger scheme hmm. of the world. Um, Neil, Thank you so much for, well, thank um, you for sharing asking. your uh, second volume on the latter life, life of uh, Edward Kennedy with us. I know there are more questions. Maybe people can pass them to you um, afterwards. Um, you know, I, I think regardless of, of, our, of our values, I, the, the phrase from the 1980 speech that was then used and reused in mm. multiple formats, right. the work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. Um, incredible words. Please join me in thanking Neil Gabler. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, until next time, please be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you.